Hola mi querido audiófilo, bienvenidos al canal de Audiófilos y Locos. Hoy te voy a compartir una pequeña charla que tuve con Keith Heron y su esposa mientras estuve el mes de agosto en St. Louis. Fui para grabar algo con Leonard Slatkin, es un pequeño grupo de música de cámara. Tocamos una pieza de él que se grabó en video. Y yo me puse en comunicación con Keith Heron. Tuve la oportunidad de visitarlo. Me recibió en su casa con muy buena hospitalidad y hicimos un pequeño tour de su taller, pero pasó algo muy curioso y es que hubo una tormenta grandísima y se fue toda la electricidad. Así que hay muy poco que les comparto de su taller y creo que vas a tener una experiencia bastante audiófila porque vas a escuchar cañonazos de truenos y relámpagos eh, durante la entrevista ya que la tormenta fue bastante fuerte, lo suficientemente fuerte para cortar toda la electricidad en el área donde él vive. Y muchas gracias a Keith Herron y a su esposa Joan por haberme recibido en su hogar. Pero tuvimos una buena oportunidad para hablar de audio, de su filosofía. Herron Audio es una marca muy especializada, tiene sus seguidores, pero no es una compañía gigantesca como Macintosh, y marcas así que tienen acreedores y son corporaciones que necesitan hacer dinero y por lo tanto a veces rebajan la calidad de sus componentes porque necesitan producir más y hacer más dinero para mantener ese monstruo que se ha creado económico. Keith Heron hace todos los equipos en su casa, tienen un taller personal y su esposa es la que fabrica las tarjetas y los componentes con mucho cuidado hace muchos años que lo está haciendo. Así que espero que lo disfrutes. Dale me gusta a este video si me lo he merecido. Si no te gusta, también dale no me gusta. Pero por favor explícame qué fue lo que no te gustó y así yo voy aprendiendo. ¿Ok? Gracias. Oh. Hello, Keith. Keith Heron. What a pleasure. Hi, Pedro. My pleasure to have you come visit. Thank you for your time. Uh, tell me about this synthesizer. Well, it's a Moog synthesizer. Uh, subsequent 37 uh, just got it a couple of months ago and, uh, and started to play with it makes a lot of interesting different sounds yeah that's all the good music started you bet you bet so, um, and this is the workshop of, of, of Heron Audio huh yeah this is part of it um, we do uh, circuit board uh, assembly here parts go on the boards um, final assembly here. This unit is in for uh, update. It's oh, a, uh, a beauty. ETSB 360. Oh my. We're giving it the reference upgrade. Nice. And uh, it uses four 6922 tubes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very clean sounding. Mm -hmm. Still has that tube magic though. That's, that's what I like to do. Yeah. What? I like natural sound. That's what makes you um, do um, uh, tube equipment? Uh, there's a certain kind of magic to tubes, and uh, you can get it with solid state too if you really know what you're doing. Right. But it's it's trickier. Uh, there's a lot of things to know about getting solid state to perform that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, and I've I've been working at this stuff for a number of years. I've been an audiophile since I was four. Wow, that's kind of and early. Because I hung around the record player and uh, loved it. Four. Yeah, that's, I know that because we moved when I that's was four precocious. And, a half, and I know I remember uh, the record player it was a Zenith radio and an RCA 45 RPM little changer. Uh huh. And uh, you know I was always looking behind the, the speaker trying to figure out where the people were because all the music was coming. That's out. right. <laughs> and I just loved all of that. And uh, when we moved, my brother built an RK amp. Mm. It was a uh, 30 watt EL34 amp. 15-inch qualm speaker. And My favorite tubes, EL34s. Oh, yeah, and I'd go back and forth between the Zenith, Zenith radio when I was like second or third grade and, and my brother's rig, and I'm going, that sounds better, you know. And so from that point on, I was hooked. And a number of people in my family played uh, piano, uh, trombone, uh, baritone horn. And um, you're a musician yourself? I play piano and drums. Uh, I haven't done anything professional. Mm -hmm. not in years, but I'm trying to get back into it now with uh, getting a little extra time. 
I'm going into semi-retirement here. We're slowing things down. You keep saying that, huh? Um, but people won't let you. Well, we've been selling a lot of a lot of stuff, and uh, I really enjoy talking to the people. Yeah. Uh, helping them get the kind of sound that they want. You know, going through their systems with them, impedance matching, all that kind of stuff that goes with it, and uh, it's fun. And the feedback from people has been great. Mm. It uh, gives me a good feeling. So. Great. That's so what I like to do. And I, I love the electronics. I I'm into physics and math. And so, uh, you know, all, all these weird things that go on audio that make the sound what it is, mm -hmm. it's not obvious by looking at things or just designing circuits. You can design a really clean circuit that sounds like crap. You know? mm -hmm. It's figuring out what it is that's going on with resonances, what I think I call dielectric resonance. Mm. that goes on in everything that's a dielectric, whether it's the material that's the insulation of a resistor or a capacitor, or the circuit board, or even things about the chassis, mm. where there's energy stored in, in the dielectric. And that dielectric resonates and it comes back out as a character in the sound. And we all know that from audio, from different cables and things, mm -hmm. how that affects the sound uses all that stuff so there's so much that goes on what we do here um, I design the circuit boards uh, on computers I send them out there's a couple of companies in Chicago that make the boards for us and I understand your wife she does the assembly each each page she assembles for, instance, boards. for instance these two capacitors go on on this page mm -hmm. and each page has a different part in specific directions, you know, watch direction here, in fact, the, the way the part goes on. Her soldering is fabulous. Uh, That's important. We don't have any issues with it. And she's got plenty of practice. She doesn't, she doesn't make bridges, and this stuff works. Mother oh, Nature, we got... Mother Nature's going at it out there. We got some real uh, electronics yeah, out there, electricity. Great, great pace. Yeah. <laughs> That's why the power stays on here. Yeah. So uh, she goes through the book and puts all these parts on. We have parts all over the place. And um, believe it or not, I raised a family here, but you know, we wouldn't have room to do that now. Yeah. That's and, right. Uh, I do final assembly and then uh, come on back. I do the testing back here. This is back in the dungeon. It's good, you can do some measurements while you do your laundry too. Yeah, you bet. You bet. <laughs> Here's where I do the measuring. I use a computer. Um, we can look at 135 decibels down. Uh, the noise you see here is from the generator. You see some spikes here, every multiple of one kilohertz. Uh, this is putting out one kilohertz sign, but because there's a square wave generator in the, in the generator, there's a little bit of that leaking out, so you see uh, I've got other generators that don't do that, but mm -hmm. there went the power. <laughs> well, it came back on. How about that? Oh. So, so anyway, uh, the testing gets done here. Um, I have a lot of fun with doing this kind of stuff. It's, uh, uh, and I'm very specific. Uh, when when I, uh, I'll cover up the name here of the owner, but... Okay. This is a line stage test. I go through and I look at everything that you see the check check marks for. I was right. by the window when I was <laughs> Yeah. This is Joan. Hello, Joan. Hello. <laughs> We're my just, wife. Just doing a little uh, quick walkthrough. We've, we've okay. been married for 44 years. Yes. Oh, wow. Congratulations. We've each other for close to 50. Yeah. It's yeah, coming up. Yeah, so. And you are the master builder of the boards. Oh, well. Yeah, she does. She does great work. She does uh, some sewing. She's very good at fine, intricate work. And uh, she got right into the soldering. She knows the difference between a cold solder well, joint and a solder I, joint. When I met him and, he, and I was, what, 22 and you were 25, and he had all this stereo stuff in his apartment. Yeah. So I knew this would be our life, but it's not. Nice. And yeah. you liked it, huh? You were also an audiophile, huh? I do, I do. Mm. Joan, do you take Keith in the stereo? You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you, uh, you, you have the final word about something, if it sounds good or not? 
Who has the final word? <laughs> In my house, my wife tells me if it sounds good or not. You know, um, years ago, she'd come down and say, that sounds great. And I'd go, no, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, well, there goes the power. We're talking about the, uh, looking at a resistor or, or looking at a, a musical instrument or a phono preamp. These are inanimate objects. So there's no way for us to know what they sound like until you hear them. And so here we go into the field of quantum physics. Because you know, as, as, a, as an engineer and a musician, mm -hmm. you have this confluence where you think, okay, I have to design it so it has the least amount of distortion, so it measures well, but what does it sound like? Yeah, How well, do you there was this, this odd thing that brings in the dielectric resonance is there was a place in St. Louis that's now defunct, Gateway Electronics, and what they did was they sold plus electronics parts. And uh, so I go down there on the weekends and fill my basket up with all kinds of capacitors and things and I'd make uh, preamps and things with either op amps or tubes and I listened to all these different capacitors and I wasn't even into resistors back then because I didn't think resistors were going to sound different. This was close to 40 years ago. and uh, But I got to the point where I was picking up the capacitors and, you know, making, you know, hitting them and whatever and I'm going, there's a resonance there that I think uh -huh. I hear in the music. And I, wow. I got so good at it that I'm either really fooling myself or I can predict to a certain extent, and I've, then I've found that out to be with resistors, I can hear metal oxide resistors in an audio circuit because they have a characteristic sound to them that I don't like. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's like making a stew with all kinds of spices where you're supposed to have no taste when you're done. And, exactly, right? And, right, and, and... So you add your own spices to your sound in your equipment. Yeah, well, the the, they're, they're anti-spices. They're, they're supposed to, you know, like anti-matter. They're supposed to cancel out this one spice that's sticking out. You need to do something to uh, okay. neutralize it. So you uh, go for neutrality and... Yeah, because that's where the real fun is. That's when things start to sound real. I see. And, oh, the speaker cones are the worst. You can tap your fingernail on the speaker cone and you can hear how it's going to resonate. Oh, and so you try to design the crossover where that characteristic, if you measure what frequency that is, and it's a range of frequencies, you try not to use it where it resonates the most. And uh, so the same trick seemed to work with capacitors, you know, hitting on them with my fingernail. And uh, I found resistors are doing the same thing. And uh, so that becomes a problem. You got a circuit board. <coughs> and there was always this discussion, which is real, point to point wiring seems to sound better. But I'm using circuit boards. And we found that, and they're in their instructions, certain resistors are going to stand up off the board. So they're allowed to not resonate with the board. And so all these tricky things make a difference. And uh, I'm telling everybody else how to do stuff now, so and that's fine, I'm retiring. <laughs> I've got a lot I could unload on everybody that, that might yeah, be helpful. Some people yeah. are gonna disagree with all of this. And you of know, course. that's that's always the case with audio. And uh, uh, you know, I've just, I've done all of this from my own perspective and I've been reasonably successful. The feedback has been quite good. Um, I'm not much for bragging about myself, so I'm, this is where I've run out of words here. But it's uh, it's just something I've always enjoyed. It was a motivation where I'd wake up in the middle of the night with an idea, and it would either work or it wouldn't. But mm -hmm. in some cases, it did, and uh, so uh, that helped me do what I do. It's uh, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about politics and stuff going on in the rest of the world. If we all listened to music, there wouldn't be all these problems in the world. That's right. I see you got some music going there, Joan. I'm to. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what else to say. I I could talk, I guess, on and on, but.
Uh, uh, I can ask you some questions. Sure. Like, um, I'm sure you guys uh, have gone to hear the St. Louis Symphony. Oh, yeah. On yeah. Time to time. And what would you say to audiophiles who never leave the cave, who just, who are, you know, crazy about the equipment and they're obsessed with the equipment? What would you say to them? Why should they go hear live music? Well, a dose of reality is always a good thing. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I have my, I've been to Powell Hall many times over the years, and my favorite place is at the back of the balcony, six rows from the back. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, why would you like it there? You don't get the sound stage and whatever, but there's just some magic the way the, the sound is back there. And, I mean, you can hear that triangle. And the timpani, the, the mallets on the heads, and all the, the fine detail back there. And the sound is so full and nice. And uh, shoot, last time I was there, they had eight basses. And it's just a nice, rich sound. And it's rich because, you know, it should be. Uh, I don't intentionally make rich sound in audio equipment because some things aren't supposed to sound rich. <clears throat> it should come from the master, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It, it should sound like it really is. Otherwise, if you make everything sound the same, guess what? You're going to get bored, yeah. and you're going to sell that audio equipment and go buy something else. And, you know, it's fine if, if it sounds lush, and you, if the first sex, six records are sexy sounding, and you really get into it. Yeah. By the time you get to a couple dozen records, you go, well, gee, everything sounds the same. You know, and these weren't all recorded in the same place, and this isn't all the same orchestras or bands or rock bands or jazz. You know, I like quite a range of things, but I don't want to hear that same kind of sound every time, unless it was supposed to be there. And that's, that's an interesting phenomenon, uh, the fatigue of the equipment fatigue, because you can measure a lot of things. Yeah. You can measure the equipment's, you know, with an oscilloscope, the frequency response, and the, you know, all those plots and the yeah. distortion. But after you you listen to your preamp for six months, or your DAC, or your speakers, and suddenly you decide, I don't like this sound anymore. How do you measure that? Well, um, I think you just said it. You you either get bored and you, you find a new hobby. <clears throat> Or you buy new equipment, and and it. So maybe you're just hearing coloration. Yeah, you're that's. Getting tired of the coloration. You get tired of that coloration. So if you can build something that doesn't have coloration, then every recording becomes something different, and then you're not you're not stuck with that repetitive, always the same kind of sound kind of yeah. thing. And so, yeah. Um, I like to hear the different sounds of the different venues. <clears throat> we played a recording of a church here with a three-second decay time, and <clears throat> if we listened to enough of those recordings, you would, you could tell the place was made out of concrete, and there's a little dryness to the sound because mm -hmm. that's the way it sounds when we go down there. And so you want that, you know, to be true to true fidelity is is. I guess the word to use for it, and uh, uh, different places are going to have different kinds of sounds depending on the concert halls and how they're made, and the number of people in there, and everything else. So, and when you sit, when you sit back there in uh, Power Hall, you realize that the sound of the orchestra it's really not very much like the sound of a recorded orchestra because you're not listening through tweeters. You know, it's a it's a very velvety sound, plus the distance of the orchestra. You know, there's a lot of air in between you and the orchestra. Good point, good point. You know, <clears throat> the mics are hanging over the stage. They're going to pick up those violins and the sweet highs, and they're going to be strong, and the brass. And when you're out there in the audience, you're a ways from that, and those highs get filtered off. I had a friend say, well, you know, this particular setup. It wasn't something that I had done, but he says, well, that's too bright. And I said, well, how do you know? Well, I, I used to go to this, uh, it was a concert hall up in um, Boston Pops. What's the, 
venue. Um, sorry, I can't think of it right now. But me neither. Yeah. It. Uh, he said, "Well, you sat out in the audience. You weren't where the microphones were. It's not going to sound like what where you sat. That's right. It's these recordings, and then of course there's people doing mastering. And you know, some of them have little." stereo setups or they're using headphones in some cases mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a few cases of that and you know they're trying to make it sound good on their setup but that may not be what you get uh, there's a range of sounds off CDs I played you a few things downstairs mm -hmm. where some things were kind of bright and some were bass heavy and you know it's all about how it was mastered and mic'd Mm -hmm. And uh, well, there's there's so much to know, and it's so tricky uh, where mics are located and all of that. But uh, you know, even what even what the conductor hears on stage is not ever going to be quite like you know um, what it sounds like on the recording. Uh, Mercury Living Presence did a great job with that. Capturing with the, those microphones they used, the, sh the Sheps, mm -hmm. and uh, those were special made. Uh, they had a little bit of a presence peak, which is what Robert Fine liked, but and Harry Pearson liked that too. I listened with him a few times, and uh, so do I. I like, I don't like a dull sound. I like, I like a nice crisp, crisp sound if, if it's supposed to be. Also, maybe you have to do that to compensate for the fact that you're listening to an audio system. There has to be something there to distract you a little more. Well, it might be, but it's add some realism. What you enjoy listening to, yeah. Um, uh, you know, tone controls can be a problem because they do phase shifts. I've experimented yeah. with some other ways of they bringing the highest. popular these days. Yeah, there's there's some ways of doing some of that that, that works better. Uh, I'm not going to go into all that detail right now, yeah. but uh, what you want to do is get the kind of sound you like and you enjoy, and that's the ultimate goal. You know, we're all a little different, but in a way, we if we've been around, we know what things should sound like, and uh, I have my own opinion, and fortunately, a lot of people agree with me, so it's uh, it's worked out well. And uh, I don't know what else to say on the subject. Ask me a few more questions. Okay. <laughs> well, when you're sitting at the very back of Power Hall, for example, do you not uh, get the feeling that you're actually, because you're so far away from the orchestra, that we're actually listening in mono? You're right. You're and right. so you get that feeling of the space, and of course you, you hear we left and right, but yeah. it's almost like it's, when you're far away, it's just one source, as if it was a mono. It's kind of interesting, and <clears throat> you know, I haven't analyzed it. Certainly, you're getting a lot of reflections from the hall. You don't have much coming from behind you, except the back wall, which is pretty close when you're up there. Um, so it's hard to say it was just enjoyable, is the word I would use. And I'm always looking for enjoyable sound. Know, so, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get you there because I'm a big fan of mono. Yeah, well, I am too. And, and so I feel like this may be the future. I mean, after all, if people are clamoring for cassettes to be back, maybe the next thing should be mono. There are, there are thousands of millions of records out there in, the, in Goodwill stores that want to be rescued, of great performances, great musicians, and, you know, we have the mono cartridges, but... I wish more manufacturers would think about making a mono phono stage, for example. Yeah. With the right curves, with all the different non standard curves. What would you think about that? Well, I have a mono switch on the line stage. <coughs> the problem you can get into is when you've got two channels feeding to mono, if the cartridge isn't aligned precisely right, Right. You can get some additions and cancellations that are sound a little phasey. Uh, I don't run into that much. With our phono stage, we made sure both channels had the exact same response. Well, and I measured that, and I could see them both on the screen at the same time, so I, I, I knew that they had to be accurate. And, and I had ways to tweak 
the units, which I tell the customers not to do because I've done that for them. Yeah. And the pots I use, you know, after 25 years, they're still right on. Mm -hmm. it, you could also just use one channel, <coughs> but my question is, you know, would, would anybody consider making a, a mono phono stage that would include, you know, the DECA curves, the uh, AS, yeah. a, B, B, U, um, I've you looked know, at all of that. The well curves. I've got all of those curves. I've calculated what I would need to do. <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, you've got to be one who has appreciation for that era back before RIAA became standard. Uh, and most of the records out there play fairly well with RIAA. Now, there's some that aren't, you know, so I'm not making a blanket statement there. But um, I've studied all those curves. and. You know, I think you could just use one channel of one of our phono stages and get good mono just doing it that way. So, uh, you know, I showed you a box set down there. It's uh, Eugene Normandy Philadelphia Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not giving an exact number here. I'm taking a guess, but I'm going to say two thirds of the recordings in that set were mono. So, Canini's also <coughs> that you have. You yeah. Have oh, yeah. Those are 90% or 100% mono. And so, uh, yeah, and they sound great and they're fun. No, no question about it. <clears throat> and even on a stereo system, I get that nice central image. And uh, right. you just sit back, close your eyes, and boy, it's just fun. I have a dedicated mono system in which I only use one speaker. I have a Klipsch La Scala <coughs> speaker, and I have it in one corner. And <coughs> it gives me the freedom that I can sit wherever I want, and it does fill the room just as well. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. the great thing about having a horn speaker that's mono is that you get that presence, you know, the, the violin and the voices, they oh, just yeah. jump out. You're not going to get maybe the quality of sound that you get with your hi-fi speaker, but the presence is something. Yeah, unique. I love presence is, is everything for me. Uh, I want... I want to close my eyes and feel like I go out and touch the performers. Oh. And, and uh, I get that a lot now. Um, I wish everybody could, but I've, I've gone kind of nuts with <clears throat> even the speaker cones, treating them and doing things to try to mm -hmm. tame resonances and things to get them to sound more natural. And not everybody can do that. So that's, uh, but it's what I like to do. So. Maybe this will be a good retirement project, make a mono, mono preamp with well, different maybe. curves. Maybe so. Maybe so. And a mono amp. <laughs> I've got, I've got a three hundred B amp. I've got calculations amp. down there. I, uh, I did the RIAA curve to like eight decimal places using the time constants in an Excel spreadsheet, which is quite extensive to do that. But I could plug in different time constants into that for the different. Uh, curves and I could get much more precise uh, numbers than would ever have been recorded because you know the, especially the older recordings they were using parts that you know capacitors and resistors in their filter networks that probably weren't nearly as accurate as you could get today but even today you don't get that kind of accuracy and then other things affect the response too of course uh, even platter mats change that uh, color of, of the sound. Yes, and, uh, uh, we're and getting in the subjective now, from, an, from the engineer's point of view, the subjective. So well, yeah, and it, it is subjective, but it's uh, when you change a platter mat and you change the color of the sound, you know that the vinyl is resonating and so is the mat and things underneath it too, the, you know, the platter itself. So and some so, things cannot be measured then. Well, just like, <clears throat> does a, what, what's a capacitor going to sound like, you know? Well, right. Or uh, a soprano. So you can have two sopranos sing the same range, yeah. and you can measure the frequency, but they sound different. Yeah. So how do you measure that? Timber. Well, you know, uh, I can't answer say. that one. I can answer, answer the capacitor one because I've right. gotten kind of where I, I can, uh, you know, test their physical properties uh, and how they resonate. Same thing happens with the platter mat. 
and um, a felt mat uh, versus a rubber mat. We used to see rubber mats a lot. With, and I've kind of gone back to the rubber because you get uh, you get some good things happening, but they're not all the same. I've got like 15 different rubber mats down there, and there's only one I like. And I'm not going to tell you who's right now, but that's... Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, you know, I ask you this question because uh, out of house these days they tend to go online on YouTube or look at measurements and they feel like, well, if it measures well, it's going to sound great, so I'm going to buy this because it measures. Yeah, well. measurements are only worth so much. They tell you if it's going to sound really bad because if it measures poorly, uh, and it. Well, what about tubes? <coughs> the tubes don't measure as well as some. Chi-Fi uh, product that has the uh, some equipment. tubes, some tubes, and uh, somebody's going to be mad out there when I say this, but some tubes will have less distortion than transistors, and that shocks people when you say that. But a good triode sometimes will have less distortion than a bipolar junction transistor. And uh, there are circuits you can use with tubes. Of course, they do with transistors, too. They, they do things in op amps in particular to cancel out distortions. But you can put two tubes in a row. The second one is an inverter. And if the tubes are identical, their forward transfer curves will cancel out, and you'll get a fraction of the distortion. Why you can't remove distortion? <laughs> By having another device, and I've actually done that for people. We took this circuit, and here's the distortion, and here it shows on the scope, and here's another one just like it. And we invert the signal in between, and that stuff's all gone. And uh, and it sounds cleaner too. Well, then that just going back to that, if you, you you can measure it and you can design it, but in the end, you have to listen to it. Well, of course. To approve it. Of course. Um, like I said, I said earlier when we were you and I were talking. I don't know if I got it on on your recording, but uh, the test bench and the design work is a starting point, and then most of the work is the artwork of getting it to sound musical. Because there's all this energy running around in these circuits that are doing things outside of the circuit you know, um, dielectrics have energy in them. And that energy goes out there and it comes back into it. Uh, whether it's electrostatic or magnetic, uh, magnetic fields collapse back around coils when you interrupt the power to them. So uh, there's all kinds of things that happen. So uh, most of the work in making good audio is not just getting out an electronic cookbook and putting an op amp circuit together. Um, oh, you said the bad word, op amps. Yeah, well, they're not necessarily bad. Do you use op amps? Uh, in some of my projects, um, you heard, well, the DAC has them. Yeah. And uh, a good op amp, um, not necessarily the best measuring ones, and not necessarily the highest gain ones. If you can use a little less feedback, but how you interface them, the impedance of the output, and how it interfaces with the cable, because there's reflections in cables. So it's only uh, the implementation, basically. Yeah. You well, can make anything sound good if you know how to use it. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you use a time domain reflectometer, you'll find out there's reflections in cables, and uh, you here's. Mean? There are differences in cables? Yeah, well, the, the signal comes back to the op amp or the power amp, and it's late. And it gets into the feedback, and it's trying to make a correction of something that already happened. You know, supposedly this is the speed of light, but it's a little bit less, but it's still too late to be accurate. Mm. And so we hear stuff like that. We lose the sound stage. And well, they say that the human hearing is more sensitive to time mm. uh, errors than oh. to pitch. Oh my God, uh, well, pitch, uh, I recognize your voice because of pitch, you know, and, uh, you know, throughout history, uh, evolution, you know, sounds are what protected us in many cases. Uh, it's so. a survival uh, 
it, we were not we don't have ears so we can listen to music we have yeah. ears as a survival uh, device yeah imagine sitting out in our backyard when it's not raining maybe early in the morning closing your eyes and you can identify where all the birds are in the trees now imagine the processing power that we have in our hearing i've it's astounding our vision, too, but I mean, our hearing is just amazing. And uh, I've, I've trained my brain and my ear to hear these sounds of resistors and types and stuff. And, uh, and uh, I don't like most of those sounds, but I recognize them. Mm. And it's just from practice, you know. Uh, I don't think I have any special uh, skills there. Uh, or advantage other than I've just done a lot of it you know it's like a concert pianist uh, they practice a lot yeah. you know you think wow how do they do that you know I can't play the piano like that well if you played as much as they did <laughs> yeah 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 to be able to have the sensibility to identify you know things that can be improved yeah yeah, and you get to where you recognize things that are right and things that are not right. And so you try to fix the things that aren't right without wrecking the things that are right, which is a trick in itself. And um, it just takes a lot of doing to get there. It's, you know, there's no simple overnight answers to any of it. Being back to op amps for a second, though, I don't know if I finished there, power supply is a big deal just like it is with the tubes. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on power supplies. Uh, that final regulation before you get to the actual circuits, mm -hmm. that, that has to be so pure. Otherwise, the power supply is just going to add its own character. And a lot of tube circuits are, are you know, traditionally they have electrolytic caps feeding the circuits, and they're going to give you a little bit of something going on there, too. And there's a lot of break-in with those too. So, and we all have to use them because that's the best way to store energy. But uh, you have to add some high-performance regulators in there to really nail down that power supply, so it isn't doing things to the music. Well, some hi-fi manufacturers always give you the option of adding a, an extra power supply to the products and. Uh, Maybe there's something behind that? I keep it inside the box because when you put it in another box, you've got the impedances of that umbilical cable. And so uh, you're losing a lot of the advantage uh, of having that power supply close to the audio circuitry. Now, oh, of course it's going to add noise and stuff. It doesn't have to. But in the phone states, don't you think that's a dangerous place to mm -hmm. put an internal power supply? No, because if you know what you're doing, uh, I've actually got ways in there to nullify hum and noise from, from the uh, power supply so that you don't hear it. I'll, before you leave, if the power ever comes back on, <laughs> we're going to go down there and we're going to cue up a record but not not drop the needle and I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna turn the volume up to 100 because I have a history of issues with home in my phone stages I'm still looking for the optimal phone stage well we'll turn the volume up to 100 something. we'll turn the volume up to 100 to the point where you could use that cartridge as a microphone and you, and you have a lot of stuff you won't up in that room you should you, you should be getting some home you won't have any home you won't and I won't ship them if there's any hum. And I'll go in there and tweak it so there's no hum. And if I can't do it, which is about one out of 20 to 25 phono stages, I replace the tra power transformer because the windings, these are toroids, and if they don't have the windings in exact multiples of 360 degrees, I kind of envision a, the um, electric and magnetic field, sort of like the corona around the sun where you've got one yeah. of these bursts out of here. Well, those transformers can do that if the windings aren't done just right. So there, there are some transformers, I've got a box of them down there that are rejects that 
just weren't good enough. I mean, most people wouldn't notice it, but I don't want to ship it like that. You know, if somebody says they have hum, I know they got some other kind of problem because I don't ship them like that. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a, I don't know what the word is. I'm paranoid about that kind of stuff. I just, I just want it so to be perfect. I, I get a lot, of, a lot of home sometimes. Yeah, well, in the past, I it's have. you know, it's electric and magnetic fields. It's the physics and the engineering, math, uh, Maxwell's equations. There's a guy named Faraday, Faraday that right. uh, discovered a lot of this stuff, and it's amazing. Guy had a lot of fun, and yeah. you know. He had a lot of trouble getting people to agree with him back then as to what he was doing. Well, but they have to build now these Faraday cages for the phone. Well, there's that, but he, you know, he, he noticed that you know magnetic fields. Uh, when you, ch you start a current going through there, it, a wire, you, you get a field. You know, and Maxwell gave us all the equations. Although there's another guy, and I can't think of the name right now, that did a lot of the work, but Maxwell got all the credit. Well, the step of transformers are notorious for that. You have to orient them. You have to play with the orientation, you know, to eliminate home or to. Yeah, I don't use step up transformers. I, um, my engineering tells me that there's hysteresis and all kinds of other problems with transformers. And if you build a transformer that's really good at low frequency, it's not as good at high frequency. And so there's, oh, the trade offs are crazy. Um, so you use active. Uh, active. I, I use FETs. For the moving coil amplification, I use FETs for moving coil. The equalization is all passive. I no use feedback. no feedback, no. And uh, that's why I have to make that. I set that up very accurately, and I tell people what kind of tubes to use to get the most accurate response. And if they wanted more gain, if they were going to go to 12 AX7s, let's use those have more um, Miller effect capacitance, which is the capacitance between the grid and the plate, and the more gain you have, the stronger that becomes. But some of the tubes have short plates and some have long plates, so the short plate ones have less capacitance generally, and the RIAA will still be pretty accurate, even mm -hmm. though you go to more gain by switching out the tube. So it's it's kind of a complicated thing, but uh, I try to you know give people some rules of thumb that they can use if they want more gain. 412 AX7s is 69 decibels a gain, which is a lot. So it's yeah. more, more than you're generally going to need. The important thing is to find a good quiet set of tubes. And as I mentioned to you before, it all depends on how well the vacuum is drawn on the tubes when they're made. And uh, you can't tell when you look at a tube how good is the vacuum. So some tubes are going to get noisier or be noisier than others. And it doesn't matter if they're NOS or recently made. Uh, I have buckets full of reject tubes down there. That's why I don't like to sell tubes, mm. because uh, I end up paying almost to what what the tube people do that sell them. And by the time I reject them, I'm losing money. So I've put a tubes page on the website where people can buy tubes, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know it makes it easier for me. So well. Uh, let's see if we can get back to, uh, or do we have an electricity yet? No. no, this light will come on if we get it. Oh. But we the way that power went off, <clears throat> we got one reclose and it didn't make it. And <laughs> so there's, yeah. lightning did some serious damage to uh, some part of the power we distribution. We got four inches of rain. We did, did you check it? Yeah. Oh my gosh, and that was what, in an hour? Yeah. Oh. Do we have water in the basement? <laughs> <laughs> well, it like better, it, better take a boat down there. Huh? Sounds like we have all the things to do. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Time. Thank you. This was fun. I yes. wish we had more time to listen, but I guess we got yeah, got, got uh, plenty of time to talk just being out here. So that be worked out. Time, and when you're in New York, we'll hit you with some tickets for the map. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> All right. All right.